All right, folks, welcome back. Today, I want to take a look at a paper that provides a constructive critique of serverless computing as it is today. This paper was written by researchers at UC Berkeley and published in 2019. The real promise of cloud computing is that you get access to unlimited compute, storage, and networking, but then you pay only for what you need, and you're able to scale up and down according to your computing demands. The initial offerings of serverless computing, things like AWS Lambda or their counterparts from Google or Microsoft, offer a function as a service model that goes one step towards meeting this promise in that you just write your code and the cloud infrastructure takes care of scaling it according to demand. But the authors of this paper argue that the current architecture of serverless computing is not ideal for data-centric and distributed computing workloads and doesn't go as far as it could to meet the true potential of cloud computing. They focus on looking at Amazon Lambda as a concrete example in this paper, but the points they're making apply to almost all serverless offerings available from the major vendors today. Current serverless offerings typically offer a function as a service model where you write your function in one of several languages and the cloud infrastructure takes care of running it in response to certain events. It also takes care of scaling this up and down according to how much QPS you get. Now these cloud functions by themselves wouldn't be very useful if they couldn't act on data and persist on data. So typically you need to make them work with a range of other services for storage, things like S3 or queuing and notification services for communication with other parts of your cloud application. This all sounds well and good, but before getting into the real critique of this current architecture, let's look at what use cases this matches and serves very, very well. The best fit for this architecture is when you have embarrassingly parallel functions. This is the case when each function invocation executes independently, operates on an independent piece of data and doesn't need to communicate with other functions or other invocations of the same function. Another good fit for this architecture is when you want to kick off a large batch process in response to an event. In this case, you're simply using the event-based triggering of the Lambda function to kick off a larger batch process which really does all the work. And finally, another good fit is when you chain together a lot of Lambda functions. Typically, they are stitched together via a message passing system or storage where they write temporary results and the next function reads it from there. An example of this was Autodesk's account signup process where each Lambda function handled one small part of the process. The downside to this architecture is that the latency can be really high, and in Autodesk's case, the account signup latency was as high as 10 minutes. Now that we've seen where this architecture works well, let's look at where it begins to break down. The first fundamental limitation is that these serverless functions have a limited lifetime. They are limited to 15 minutes of runtime which means that you cannot reuse or cache state that you need to use across invocations. Another big problem is that Lambda functions need to connect to other cloud services, most importantly storage, over the network. And this is a problem because currently the bandwidth they can achieve to read and write storage is about an order of magnitude slower than a modern SSD. And this is directly related to the next limitation, 
which is that lambda functions must communicate with each other through some form of storage. In the current architecture, they are not directly addressable over the network. They can only make outgoing network connections. They cannot accept incoming network connections. This makes it hard or impossible to model, for example, some kind of stickiness for a client connection. And the last limitation is about hardware, not software. The current serverless function as a service architecture lets you divide up slices of CPU and RAM. But if you look at where hardware is going, it is going increasingly in the direction of having more and more task-specific, highly specialized hardware, things like tensor processing units or GPUs for machine learning. And the current architecture of serverless computing doesn't work very well with these kinds of specialized hardware. You can sum up a lot of these problems by saying that the current function as a service architecture ships data to the code rather than shipping the code to the data. And this increases latency, bandwidth, and cost. A direct consequence of this is that if you want to build a large distributed application using this architecture, it's almost impossible. You can't coordinate thousands or millions of these invocations when they have to talk to each other via slow storage. The authors made some comparisons between serverless architectures and just using raw virtual machines to get a comparison of the cost and latency differences between these two architectures. They tried training a machine learning model as an example. And doing this on a raw VM directly talking to S3 was much, much faster and also much cheaper compared to doing this with serverless functions. On the flip side, they also tried to do predictions using the model they had just trained. Now, this should be a good fit for serverless functions because each prediction is independent. However, even in this case, they saw that just doing it on a raw VM was much faster and much cheaper. And the fundamental reason is basically that communicating all this temporary data through storage is just really, really slow. In this table, they compare the latency of communicating one kilobyte in various ways. And the fastest way is just using zero MQ. But as you start going through storage and as you start using serverless, your latency gets higher and higher. So we see that this architecture, which forces us to communicate via writing out and reading from slow storage, is not scalable. So looking forward, how should we architect the next generation of serverless functions to really deliver the full promise of cloud computing? A lot of these points are direct consequences of the limitations the authors pointed out earlier in this paper. We want to get the code closer to the data rather than the other way around. We want to build an architecture that lets us effectively use the new crop of specialized hardware. And we want the flexibility to have long running functions that can be addressed over the network. Speaking of how you would program this great new cloud infrastructure, the authors are arguing that the current crop of languages which focuses on a procedural sequential way of thinking is not a good fit. And we need something that models what they call disorderly programming in terms of stitching together various functions and having them execute concurrently. And because cloud programming is fundamentally polyglot programming, you need a way for all these different languages to interoperate and have a common intermediate representation that can be executed on the cloud. So that was a quick look at a paper that provides a critique of the current architecture of serverless computing and suggests some architectural principles 
to build a better next generation architecture. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.